and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to yet another program in our Science, Technology and Innovation Policy Forum lecture series. Not always lectures, but uh, sometimes, as in this case, a discussion or a debate, perhaps. Uh, we've been having these programs for uh, quite some time now, for over a year. And uh, several institutions which are housed at the India Habitat Center have come together to collaborate to make these programs possible. That's Terry, the Center for Science and Environment, the RIS, the CEFIPRA, which is the French Institute, and the Vigyan Prasar collaborate with the India Habitat Center in bringing this series together. And I think it's one of the most worthwhile things that we are doing collectively. Um, as you know already this evening, the discussion, oblique debate, would be on a very important issue which is confronting us, the IPCC's special report on the 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, climate change and the future of the Paris Agreement. And we have uh, a very distinguished panel here. I won't take over the role of the moderator, but just to say that we are very pleased indeed that Mr. Ranj Rajni Ranjan Rashmi is here to participate in this discussion, Distinguished Fellow Earth Sciences and Climate Change at Terry, the Energy and Resources Institute, and Dr. Navroz K. Dubash, Senior Fellow at the Center for Policy Research and Coordinator of the Climate Initiative. The discussion is moderated by Chandabhushan, a good friend, Deputy Director General of the Center for Science and Environment, and he's promised to make it as provocative as possible. So I leave it to the participants uh, to Chandabhushan to take over. Thank you very much. Nish. Good evening. Uh, I actually have uh, quite an easy job simply because uh, we have two people here uh, who like debate, debating with each other, I'm sure, and uh, who are probably the most experienced people in India on climate diplomacy and negotiations. Now, the format is going to be as follows, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to give you an overview of 1.5C report, and the last slide is going to be five or six questions that I would expect both the respondents uh, will respond to in 10 minutes' time each. So they will get 10 minutes each to respond to those five questions. They can choose to respond to all five. They can choose to respond to just one, depending on what they want to do. And then we will open the floor for question and answer, depending on your interest. If you will ask too many questions, very good. If you don't, I will, to make sure that there is debate happening uh, in the next one hour. Now, the history of, of, of these lecture and debate series at IHC has been that if it is a very interesting lecture, it goes for about one and a half hours. If it is boring, it goes for 60 minutes. So I'm hoping one and a half hours, and I'm hoping great discussion and interaction between the participants and the panelists. So let me give you uh, an overview of 1.5C report and what are the issues uh, that we will be discussing today. Well, some of you will know that the 1.5C report, the special report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, actually came out of the Paris Agreement. It was one of the agreements at Paris that a report will be made by IPCC on impacts of global warming of 1.5 degrees centigrade, and that report will be presented in 2018. So this was part of the agreement in 2015 that this report will be done. And some of you will know that actually Paris Agreement ultimate aim was a compromised language. The goal actually was quite compromised in a way that the agreement very clearly says that the world will hold the increase in global average temperature to well below two degrees, well below two degrees, ever pre-industrial levels, and pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 C. It was a very compromised, undecided statement uh, uh, that was agreed in 2015. Now we have the report. Just last month it was released. And the report essentially says that uh, we have reached one degree Celsius increase in temperature. 
the impacts are quite evident whether it is increase in extreme weather events extreme uh, floods droughts uh, increase intensity of cyclone at one degree is being experienced across the world arctic is shrinking and we will cross 1.5 degree temperature increase anywhere between 2030 and 2052 okay that's what the report the 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 headline of the report is we will breach 1.5 between 2030 and 2052 and if we breach that then this is what the key takeaways are uh the impact of 1.5c warming on economy and ecosystem is much higher than anticipated in previous scientific reports so they have upgraded in a way the impacts uh the last ar5 report for example had a much conservative estimate of impacts but now they are saying at 1.5 warming our economy and ecosystem is going to be impacted much harder at 2 degree it will be worst compared to 1.5 in fact it would be catastrophic for the poor and vulnerable communities and therefore as a reader of this report i am very clear that 2 degree target in paris agreement actually is an anti poor target if you are uh, uh if you can make out what what the ultimate conclusion of the report is but staying within the right side of 1.5 degree is going to be very very difficult it will require transformation at a very rapid pace and very quickly now this is what the key takeaways are just to give you a sense what is going to happen what is the difference between 1.5c warming and 2c warming at 2c warming the percentage of global population which will be exposed to water scarcity is going to be twice more than 1.5 half a degree temperature difference twice the number of people at 2 degree will get affected by water scarcity 10 times more people will get affected by lower crop yield at 2 degrees compared to 1.5 agricultural productivity for example there is an example of maize yield in tropics could reduce by 2 and a half time 2 degrees compared to 1.5 degree flooding will increase almost twice the percentage of global population which will be affected by fluvial flooding will be twice more than uh, uh, twice more at 2 degrees compared to 1.5 sea level rise and therefore population affected by sea level rise could be 2 to 6 time higher at 2 degrees heat wave number of people who will get exposed to heat wave could be 1.5 times higher and therefore this half a degree temperature increase is going to make a difference between life and death to a vast majority of people and therefore it is for us to decide whether we agree on 1.5 or 2 degrees similar uh, in in whether you look at uh, reduction in arctic ice impact on coral reefs permafrost very important because if you have large melting of of permafrost it will itself release large amount of methane uh, which could lead to runaway climate change methane is a super greenhouse gas 20 times more greenhouse gas potential compared to uh, carbon dioxide so basically this report makes it quite clear that if we want to save poor vulnerable communities and countries let's agree on 1.5c but there is nothing no carbon budget left for 1.5c as you know there is a direct correlation between cumulative emission of of carbon dioxide and temperature increase and the carbon budget left to remain within 1.5 degree c is only about 500 billion ton co2 from now till 2100 this carbon budget is for a century 500 and every year we are emitting about 50 billion tons so the carbon budget that is left for 1.5 c is only about 10 years of our current emissions this is what is there and therefore it is likely to get exhausted very quickly by 2030 so how do we make sure that we don't breach the carbon budget well they have pathways that the 1.5c report has come out with and in each and every pathway whether you uh, do steep reduction now or a steep reduction later on the important thing to remember is that we will actually have to suck carbon dioxide out of atmosphere we will have to deploy something called as carbon dioxide removal technology if we want to remain within 1.5 whether we as you can see we will have to do negative emission post 2050 in almost all pathway 
now we can do negative emission by by deploying natural technologies like planting as much forest as we want uh, by increasing carbon in soil but we will also have to uh, worse come to worse deploy expensive technology like carbon capture and storage bioenergy carbon capture and storage technology so if we want to meet 1.5 we will actually have to deploy all options available okay there's no one silver bullet which is going to save us uh for example in in energy sector uh coal will have to become zero by 2050 currently about a third of global energy primary energy depends on coal it will have to become zero renewable will have to supply 70 to 85% of our energy need our buildings will have to become anywhere between 20 to 40% more efficient in terms of energy demand by 2050 industries will have to reduce emissions by 75 to 90% we are talking about unprecedented unprecedented changes in our economy if we want to meet 1.5 in fact the difference between 1.5 and 2 in terms of carbon budget actually is not too much the budget for 2 degrees is about 1000 billion tons the budget carbon budget for 1.5 is about 500 billion tons so it's only about a difference of 10 years if we do not act on 1.5 most probably we will not act even on 2 okay now this is what is the status the key takeaways from 1.5c report the big question is can the paris agreement and the entire process of un framework convention on climate change deliver on 1.5c does it have the structural strength the cooperative structure to give us 1.5c that is what the big question is if we follow the paris agreement and whatever commitments countries have made in terms of reducing emissions we are actually looking at 3 degrees increase in temperature we are not looking at 1.5 so this great agreement of 2015 will take us to 3 degrees okay this is what the current status is in terms of commitment made by 150 plus countries in terms of reducing emissions currently the paris uh, agreement is deliberating rule book which is what kind of rules will be put in place but as you know paris agreement is largely about reporting self declaration self uh, commitment that countries have made it is called as ndc nationally determined contribution and it is about reporting in fact the rule book has to be ready by december but it's highly unlikely if everyone will even agree on this rule book uh, there was this talanoa dialogue uh, which which wanted to discuss contentious issue uh, facing the world but it has not produced any increase in ambition over and ever paris and dc so far so not much actually in terms of uh, discussion on reduction target is happening right now under paris agreement so what are the options let me list six <coughs> five key question that i would like the panelists to address point number 1 stay with paris agreement rely on the good faith of countries to increase ambition as part of ndc the world has agreed on an agreement in 2015 it took huge effort to get this agreement even if it is un unambitious now we hope that paris will deliver good faith will prevail and therefore countries will increase their ambition in all aspects and we will meet 1.5 option number 1 whether that is feasible or not option number 2 which donald trump wants let's renegotiate paris agreement okay and with some fluke of luck he will agree that 1.5 says important okay so let's renegotiate paris agreement answer option number 3 let's marginalize unfccc unfccc has not delivered for 25 years let's marginalize unfccc create and use sectoral and regional forums for ambitious agreements based on cooperation we need to have a plan b and the plan b is leave unfccc let's talk about regional and sectoral forums to increase ambition there are two other questions that i have addressed so the three options to the panelist 
what do we do the two other question we have i would like you to answer as well is how do we deal with the us very important and if trump gets another term how do we deal with him till 2024 okay very important issue and what should be the position of india india has always taken this position that the rich countries should do first before developing countries should take action that has been and india has has been very strong on the principle of equity and if we use the principle of equity frankly speaking uh, uh, none of the developed countries are meeting their target as per equity principles uh, so in a situation where 1.5c is going to have huge impact on countries like india what should be the new position of india now these are three options and two additional question that i have put to the panelist thank you very much thank you chandra bhushan <clears throat> the task falls on me to begin the debate uh, well it's actually i'll not start with the debate but i'll uh, respond to the questions which you have framed towards the end of, the, of your presentation uh, now the 1.5 degree report which has uh, uh, been published uh, last month and uh, which is the backdrop of discussions today it only highlights the urgency of the actions so basically the 2 degree goal is already agreed political goal it's not as if uh, there is no political consensus there is a political consensus that we should all move towards 2 degree goal even 2 degree goal uh, if you look at the history of the climate change negotiations it was very difficult to come to this goal uh, it has taken almost 30 years to first to define the kind of goal which we should have and then uh, articulate that goal in form of a temperature rise or or containment of the temperature rise uh, so lakila was the first time it was used in 2009 and then we uh, have agreed and incorporated this goal in the paris agreement 2015 it has taken a lot of time to come to this goal now if we are renegotiating this goal and coming to 1.5 degree nobody is disputing the fact that the problem is extremely humongous and we need urgent actions but do we need to shift the goal from 2 degree to 1.5 degree within a period of 3 years from 2015 to 2018 in fact you have uh, in the first slide you have yourself <coughs> made a statement that it was a response to a political call it is not a scientific assessment to begin with to uh, to write to, be, to begin with it was not a uh, assessment made by the scientists themselves they had to respond to a political question of 1.5 degree and those of you who have been following the climate change negotiations will uh, will perhaps recall the 1.5 degree goal has been articulated by a group of countries who are who consider themselves deeply vulnerable these are the small island developing states they have been at the forefront of the demand for defining a climate goal in terms of stabilization at 1.5 degree nobody says and most of the countries agree that we need to stabilize the climate at a level in fact the article of the convention and the paris agreement both of them say that these goals are need to be consistent with the overall goals of sustainable development food security economic growth poverty eradication these are also equally fundamental goals so they have we have to find a balance between this so what do we do about this 1.5 degree goal do we renegotiate the paris agreement as you say and then incorporate this goal i think this will be a self defeating strategy we have already decided about a goal we need to pursue uh, uh, move in the direction of this goal and define our actions define a strategy rather than redefine the goal itself that is the first point uh the the other uh, dimension of renegotiating the paris agreement is not just about goal you see the question is us is a major emitter uh, it continues to be uh, to dominate the world politics and it continues to dominate the world emissions profile if us is not participating in the negotiations constructively 
whether you renegotiate the Paris Agreement or you have any other agreement, it is going to be meaningless. So therefore, we have to re uh, look at uh, the, the, uh, the whole problem in a practical manner. What is it that we really want? We want the climate to stabilize. We want the global emissions to be controlled in a manner that they become consistent with the sustainable development <coughs> goal. Now, <coughs> renegotiating the Paris Agreement which, ha which is a result, which is the Paris Agreement is a result of last very contentious, very fractious climate change negotiations. If uh, we reopen the whole agreement, we are not going to lead, go anywhere at all. In the next three years or five years, even in the ten years, I do not know. The architecture of the Paris Agreement is very, very carefully designed. You have yourself said that it gives the complete freedom to the countries to define their nationally determined action. This was one of the central uh, questions in the Kyoto Protocol. Kyoto Protocol was a top-down agreement where the, the, the global goal was, or, or the goal for the developed countries, 37 developed countries, rich countries, which are listed in the Kyoto Protocol, the goal was defined for them. Reduce your emissions by 5.2% compared to 2005 level. But nobody actually did that. Very few countries. Very few countries whose Mar uh, emissions would make a very marginal impact on the total global emissions. But most of the other developed countries did nothing about it. And why did it fail? Because it was about top down. Because it was forced by so called uh, the, the internationally environmentally conscious community. The, the, the uh, stake, uh, which uh, actually the stake of the, in the, the go governments which have to implement an economic growth strategy which is environment friendly was not enough. So therefore the whole question is how do you make the countries buy a strategy which is environmental friendly. And that is the success of the Paris Agreement. After 20 years of struggle the Paris Agreement has allowed all countries to come on board Every single country without exception is a part of the Paris Agreement. Of course, US has walked out of it. That's a separate question. There are other countries also waiting in the wing. I, Russia has still not ratified the agreement. Canada is uh, struggling to walk out. Australia is struggling to redefine its position. There are countries, but they're all following the US example because it has given them a, 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 a sort of uh, different expectation. But uh, that apart. The Paris Agreement is a result of very, very hard struggle and we need not destabilize it at this stage. Having said that, what is it that 1.5 degree report recommend? What does it recommend? If you, uh, uh, of all of you who are uh, following the climate change, uh, uh, not the negotiations but the, the issue of the climate change oh. would uh, realize that it has two specific dimensions. We have to talk about emissions and we have to talk about the impacts. So therefore, this 1.5 degree report also, it talks about global emissions pathways, which can be followed to stabilize the climate at 1.5 degree. We ha already have the, the ass assessment report 5 of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change had recommended a s particular global emission pathway to stabilize the climate at 2 degree. So we have now a better scientific uh, assessment which helps us understand what are the possible emission pathways which we can follow to stabilize. Now, the most fundamental uh, recommendation in the, uh, the em emerging from the glo uh, global emission pathways which uh, 1.5 degree report has talked about is that we need to bring down the emissions sharply the current uh, emission reduction commitments that countries have made on their own under the Paris Agreement are not adequate. That is the general assessment. It's not a part of the report, but this is the general assessment that if we uh, take the entire, uh, the, 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 the impact of the all the targets which have already been given or in uh, adopted by the uh, countries, we will still go up to three degree or four degree rise in the terms of temperature. So obviously we need to take more urgent action. So that is the fundamental recommendation that we need to alter the emission pathways globally to be able to stabilize the climate earlier. This is a conclusion which nobody disputes. Question is what is it in terms of technological applications and strategies that we can adopt nationally. Targets are one thing. 
even the existing targets are extremely difficult for some countries to achieve. Uh, I'll, I'll come to India a little later after having uh, listened to Navroz. But uh, as far as the, the global targets are concerned, in for some countries, even the existing targets extre it's extremely difficult to, uh, to, to implement. Even the U.S. is, fine, is struggling with its targets. Um, I, I don't know because if they have, they, have, they have already switched to shale gas in a very substantial manner, therefore they are able to reduce their emissions in last year, but it's again rising. So it's difficult. So question is of uh, de uh, devising a proper strategy for low carbon growth, which is consistent with sustainable development and which helps countries make the energy transition. Energy is central. The, the way we conduct our energy systems, the energy production system, the energy um, uh, consumption, we have to alter these patterns. And we have to alter these patterns substantially. But it needs adequate technologies and adequate resources with the countries which are implementing these strategies. At the current level of resource availability and technological uh, uh, availability, I do not think this is possible. Although the report does talk about some of the technologies, but these technologies currently are not within the realm of practical applications. The bioenergy, carbon capture and storage, leave aside bioenergy CCS, even CCS, which is uh, where in some pilot cases have uh, examples are exist, they, they exist and this technology has been applied, even that is not uh, practical for some of the countries, even including India. So the, the fun the ultimately, the question uh, uh, is that of following a sustainable development path that is practical, pragmatic, and we need to ensure that the finances and the technologies which help us make this tra energy transition are available to us. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chandrabhushan. First of all, I'm, I'm delighted to see an overflowing room uh, on a topic uh, uh, like this, 1.5 report of the IPCC. Um, and I also have to uh, commend both the speakers who came before me. I think Chandrabhushan did a fabulous job really boiling this uh, complex issue down to uh, its essence. So I think, you know, my, in my view, the uh, sincerest form of flattery is, is a strong engagement. So in that spirit, I'm going to um, push back very hard on Chandrabhushan. I'll come to the three questions uh, which will fall out of three propositions that I wish to make, uh, which suggest that there's a whole different way of looking at this problem. So the starting point is, first uh, proposition is this. The 1.5 report and the way in which Chandrabhushan presented it implies that the speed of the global response to climate change is directly proportional to the target we set. In other words, you set a more stringent target, you're more likely to have faster uh, uh, reduction. And I really question this. I think that we have the global community for two decades now has been talking about targets and timetables with the presumption that only that the act of setting the target will drive changes in national systems. And one reason we haven't been able to set targets is people know that national systems are not going to react that fast, there are a lot of uncertainties and so on and so forth. Let's do a thought experiment. Suppose that, in fact, if you set a target from 2 degrees to change it to 1.5, national systems react faster and mitigate faster. Does that mean that if we change the target to 0 0.7, it'll be even faster? No, we're already past 0 0.7, right? If we say it has to be 0 0.5, we'll speed up even more? No, because at some level, this is a political system. So this isn't a, this isn't a system that reacts in a linear way to the pressures that are put on it. It is mediated through political systems. Now, Chandrabhushan, among others, actually, I think, made a statement that was quite useful right around Paris when this 1.5 bit business was inserted in the report, where they said, listen, you know, this 1.5 is probably unrealistic given the carbon budget, right? And the whole Paris architecture is built around a learning by doing process, which says, Let's get started with what we, uh, 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 with low carbon reduction. And through that learning by doing and subsequent ratcheting up, we might be able to actually move faster than we thought when we were setting the targets. In other words, and this is the second proposition, the assumption is always that what countries say they will do is what we should be seeking. But actually, 
measuring what they are actually doing may be more important. So this discussion about the targets is always about what countries say and not what they do. And I think that the, the, the s small glimmers of hope, and let me <coughs> first say I completely agree that this is a very dire situation. We need to accelerate. It would be great if we could reach 1.5. I'm just not sure the chances are enhanced greatly by proclaiming that we want to reach 1.5. Instead, the chances are enhanced by having countries accelerate what they're doing at home. A lot of times, uh, uh, so, so um, uh, let's take India for example, right? India just put out its uh, biennial update report, which is the sort of bureaucratic version of adding up our numbers. And we have basically reached 21% uh, emissions intensity reduction. And our target said that we would reach 20 to 25% intensity reduction by uh, 2020 from 2005 levels. In other words, we've already reached our target, right? Uh, two years early. Many people suspect that the targets that countries have put out there are conservative targets. They're sort of targets that say, well, let's just do what, you know, something that isn't too hard to achieve. If we overachieve it, we can always claim we're, we're, uh, uh, we're successful. And any rational actor in a multi-level game like this, in a multi-year game, would do that, right? It's a logical strategy. So therefore, the targets are meant to be indicative. They're meant to be about direction of travel. What's more important is what the targets do in terms of mobilizing domestic machinery. In India, the National Action Plan, the missions, the uh, renewable energy targets, et cetera, et cetera. The hope in climate change is that through learning by doing, we will find two things, uh, we will find out two positive things. One, we will find out that it's cheaper than we thought to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And two, we will find out that there are many other objectives we want to achieve that happen to be coterminous with mitigation, such as air quality, energy security, et cetera. And for those reasons, we will accelerate what we do, right? We don't know that that will always be the case and it will be different in different countries, but this learning by doing dynamic is what saves us. If that is right, what, what is more important than setting a number is setting in place national machineries to experiment and try things and see if in fact it is cheaper than we thought. So the third proposition that follows is that the center of gravity uh, uh, of the climate debate is actually in national systems, not in the international process. Which is not to say the international process is uh, irrelevant. My colleague, Lavanya Rajamani, who's an international lawyer, who's written long and very serious books about the international process, will tell us in many ways how it is important, and it, and it, it is indeed. But I think the difference from 20 years ago is that the international process is playing a supportive role for changes that will have to be driven by shifts in national politics. Now, what follows from that is that national politics will deal with climate change in different, uh, different national politics will deal with climate change differently. In some countries, perhaps the European Union, climate change itself will be a driver of, of shifts in the economy. In other countries, such as India, it will be more about co-benefits. And the Paris Agreement's genius, in a sense, is that it's flexible enough to allow different systems to put their own sort of um, uh, uh, articulation and rationality on, on why they move. So uh, with these three sort of propositions, that the speed is not necessarily proportional to the target, but actually pro uh, proportional to implementation, uh, that's more important what we do than what we say, and that the center of gravity is at the, interna is at the national level with an important supportive role for the international level to ratchet up, provide transparency, and so on and so forth. That gives us the answer to our questions. Should we rely on the good faith of countries? No, but we should rely on national political systems realizing that in their own self-interest, whether for co-benefits reasons or because the costs are not so high, they are willing to actually accelerate action and rely on national advocacy, mobilization, etc., to make that case ever more powerful. So, you know, all the young people who work on climate change who show up to the negotiations, I always advise them, you know, the time has come not to fly to Poland or Bonn, but actually to spend time at home trying to bring about that change at home. Should we renegotiate Paris? Absolutely not. Because the risk is that the machineries that countries have put in place, I mean, just in India, the biennial update report led to conversations across lots of ministries. Mr. Rashmi can tell us the national action plan led to all kinds of uh, machinery put in place, state action plans, and so on and so forth, stimulated by the international process, which is why the international process is important. 
you start blurring the international process, shaking it on its foundations, all those national machineries will move to slow, which is why we absolutely should not touch it. Uh, and third, use sectoral and regional forums. Sure, because in some countries, it is about the climate rationality. Uh, you can find these sort of you know, coalitions of the willing in certain places around certain issues, around energy efficiency, around renewables, and so on and so forth, to, to have these sort of side agreements uh, that will help spur national economies forward. So that's, uh, that's let, me, let me stop there, and we can deal with the other questions, uh, as you wish, Chandra Bhushan. Frankly, both the panelists have reached the same conclusion from different route. Uh, uh, <clears throat> so let me open the floor for clarification. Then I'll come back with another series of questions. Yeah. Uh, I'll take in a group of three. You were the first person. So please. And I'll come back to the side. Yeah. Please introduce yourself. My name is Narendra Jalan. Hello. My name is Narendra Jalan. I wanted to know that 150 countries have signed the Paris Agreement. What percentage of carbon emission that they represent? And what percentage are the remaining ones which, which they haven't signed? OK. Please write that question. OK. Uh, the side, two of you, and then I'll come back. Um, hi, my name is Utsav. Uh, I'm a student of uh, Tufts University. Just uh, did my international business degree there. And uh, my question is uh, to Dr. Dubash. Uh, you spoke about uh, the national political system being the center of gravity for action to take place. So could you speak a little bit about uh, three things in that sphere? Uh, the awareness of policymakers. Number two, the training and funding required to take action. And number three, uh, the institutional incentive structures. How should they be aligned to reach these goals? OK. On the back one, I'll come back to you later. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, my name is uh, Shelly Kady, and I'm a PhD student with uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. Uh, uh, generally, like from the talks, what I could get, there was like a larger focus on mitigation and not so much adaptation, because it just seems to me that uh, we are not really like in a very pessimistic Pessim uh, we, are, we are not in a very optimistic track uh, in terms of like the temperature target set. So, uh, you know, what would be your comments on like, you know, adaptation and countries also cooperating on <coughs> adaptation? Uh, that is uh, first question. The second question is the role of uh, not just, uh, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Dubash said that, um, um, that, you know, that this, um, that you know, the larger mediation is through political systems, but there is also like economic systems and the business sector. So, um, and even if we see in terms of the international systems, what the WTO says, and what like maybe countries could put into place could, for example, be against the free trade uh, principle. So what would you have to say, um, and because businesses are a major source of emissions, so what would you have to say in terms of both the international system and the national system because they could actually be in conflict with each other. Okay. So I will address the first one. Uh, you have a question and adaptation maybe you can. Okay. So the 150 countries, all those who have signed the Paris Agreement represent more than 99% of the total emissions. The 176 countries. It's about almost everyone. In fact, top 20 countries account for 80% of the emissions. So if you just tackle Top 20 countries in the world will take care of 80% of the emission and 1.5 C target. So, Navroz and then. Yeah, so, so uh, two questions on, on uh, very quickly. Um, so, unpacking what it would take to mobilize national political systems. I think that uh, uh, maybe let's just speak about India to keep it to keep it limited. I think um, uh, in India there is. Uh, you know, there's been a shift in the conversation. Uh, climate change used to be entirely a diplomatic issue. How do we make it a, a, you know, how do we preserve sort of the space for action for India domestically? Now I think increasingly there is a sense that we are engaging with a low carbon future. I think the, the decrease in cost of renewable, renewable energy has made it much easier to have that conversation. I do think that there is an awful lot of work that remains to be done to figure out how you bring climate, climate goals and development goals together. When do they actually synergize? When are there trade-offs? Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done around that 
Uh, and I think that's sort of a, a question we should be asking ourselves in a more focused way. So I'll keep it brief, uh, and maybe we can talk about this afterwards. Um, you know, when I, the, the second question, um, you know, when I talked about national politics, what I, what I was meant in a sort of encompassing term, uh, encompassing sense was, what are the ways in which uh, national political systems are likely to move uh, uh, forcefully in the direction of low carbon future, and what is likely to hold them back? And that means understanding also the winners and losers, and the winners and losers are a function of understanding what the costs are, what the interests are, which things benefit, which part of the business community, uh, so it's rather political economy. So the broader political economy of uh, action around climate change is, is what I was alluding to, but you're right very much to, to sort of pull out uh, that aspect. And uh, you know, we've, we've been having some conversations with business people, and you see large business in India has really climbed on board this, this bandwagon about low carbon development, but large business is only a small piece. You know, the MSME sector, the informal sector, and so on, it's a whole, it's a whole different story. So I think, I think trying to figure out ways of broadening that conversation uh, among the business community are also necessary if the larger politics are going to shift. Okay, Rashmiji, on adaptation. Yes, uh, I fully agree with you. This uneven emphasis on the mitigation or uh, containment of the emission trajectories vis-a-vis uh, -vis the adaptation goals, this is problematic both globally as, as well as uh, in formulating the national policies. Uh, fortunately, when the National Action Plan on Climate Change was drawn up in India, uh, there are eight missions there and uh, uh, there are um, two of them are specifically focused on mitigation, one on solar and the other on energy efficiency. But rest five, they're all focusing either on the no knowledge or on adaptation. Now, while it is good to talk about adaptation, the the uh, uh, we need to have a sense of uh, the size of the problem globally as well as nationally uh, unfortunately in the 1.5 degree report which we are talking about adaptation is a complete hole there is nothing on adaptation at all there the the funding uh, in fact the funding assessment which was uh, made as part of the initial draft it had to be watered down because the energy investment uh, assessments itself were so huge uh, it, there is a paragraph on that and it talks about 900 billion, billion dollars per year almost. But that is only for energy transition investments. There is not a single <coughs> figure quoted there about adaptation impacts, imp the cost of impacts. And the cost of impacts are huge on vulnerable countries. India is a hugely vulnerable country to climate change. So adaptation unfortunately doesn't find the same degree of, uh, uh, doesn't uh, uh, elicit the same degree of response as mitigation. Mitigation is perhaps a catchy word, and it's uh, uh, good to talk about it uh, in terms of future of the climate change, but the impact of climate change is here and now. We need to find uh, resources to handle this aspect. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll just uh, touch upon the institutional structure, which I think the lady had uh, mentioned, and uh, Navroj has also touched upon. Uh, in, a, in a federal country like ours, where uh, we have to, the, the central government policies have to take the state governments on board. Uh, we need to um, understand this fact that climate change till date is the responsibility of the central government. It is, it is a federal responsibility. It is still not, as far as the emissions, uh, the, the policy of emissions control is concerned, it is still a responsibility of the central government. It is not the responsibility of the state governments. The state governments can only talk about sustainable development. And, and they are the ones which are actually vulnerable. They are at the uh, receiving end. So states will, whenever the moment you talk about an institutional structure which enhances awareness about climate change and uh, the assesses, uh, we assess the funding requirements, we have to look at the adaptation. And ad the adaptation needs of the state governments. That's huge, very, very, is really humongous. And uh, we need to really be imaginative in the kind of resources we generate both within the budget and from the market to be able to address th this issue there there was somebody had mentioned about private sector involvement of the private sector my own assessment is that unless we uh, now uh, the time has come uh, uh, that the, the the corporate sector begins to internalize the 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 environmental cost uh, so far we have been uh, trying to avoid this 
uh, on the ground that we have to fight other battles and but the environmental battle is equally urgent and important and the corporate sector must take the lead but for this we have to have an efficient carbon pricing and carbon market now the carbon price does not have to be fixed globally or even explicitly it can be internalized by the corporate sector itself there are ways of doing it i think that's a ma matter of separate debate okay i'll take three questions from here one number two up uh, i'll take yours <coughs> thank you i want to make a brief comment you know we have been talking about this uh, climate change for so many decades now at least three four decades when awareness has increased but i we have been talking about sustainable development also now i think we are forgetting one thing we can use new technology for carbon capture we can reduce we can increase our contribution of renewable energy but it is, is it helping us we are seeing within last 2 3 years when this paris agreement was finalized the situation is going from bad to worse in, in spite of the fact that i and this is have been declared now when we i think it is the sustainable development which is more important we talk about it but we really don't understand it and the main aspect i may sound anti development perhaps if i say all this but i think it is a reduction in consumption consumption is very important if we reduce consumption then all the problems will be taken care of because with all the technology and whatever we may do we may not be able to achieve if we are having four TVs we are having a four bedroom house we are having 10 mobiles in a house we are having so many cars production factories have to be there the we need land the forest has to be cut the carbon sink has to be reduced so i think there is a crux and i think our great leader gandhi ji and other leaders also told us 125 years back we have enough for our need but not for our greed thank you and we are really not following it and secondly the solution lies with the people it doesn't lie with the government population explosion especially in those poor countries if there is so much i mean there will reduce consumption i think there are the two aspects which we need to focus okay. very much all over thank, the world. thank you and the solution lies with the people with us not with the government okay thank you i think i'll take it as a comment uh, yeah of course of course there is of course a possibility let me just yeah please yeah Yeah, Dr. Balakrishnan, RIS Science Diplomacy Fellow. Now, as we head towards the next COP in Poland, uh, we cannot just ignore this report. As far as the Paris Agreement is concerned, I think there will have to be an intense discussion about strengthening the Paris Agreement, however difficult or impractical it may be. Secondly, you know, apart from the U.S., uh, there is also some indication of countries like Brazil, who want to exit from. the paris agreement so the conditions look very gloomy for this thirdly uh, there are there is a unexpected increase in methane emissions over the us uh, it may be linked with hydraulic fracturing and natural gas industry nobody wants to talk about it there is also an unexpected increase in hfcs which is a super green uh, warming gas so the impact of all this uh, on the global warming is still to be factor may make things worse our global climate models need to be improved they are still very crude they are not granular enough and this is very important for us because we need to be able to calculate more precisely the impact of uh, increased uh, greenhouse gas on areas within our country now I, i know this is very very ambitious but it's still possible uh, we have got Uh, global climate models which are based on things like very gross <coughs> parameters like radiative forcing and uh, even uh, the distribution of warming across the globe is very crudely projected okay so we have to put in more money and effort into this on the scientific side our scientists across the world have to come up with more precise uh, calculations okay thank you let me i'll just give it to the gentleman here he has some later i'll just take three and then come back please yeah uh, good evening my name is bb tiwari been advisor par in delhi and i run my own small hydro plants in uttarakhand firstly to all the uridite speakers uh, mr chandrabhushan uh, put it in very good digital format 
and the pointed question that Rajni answered and Dubash, I am going to put through to you a simple ground reality. And since you people probably live in Delhi, you would have the answers to yourself. Number one, the fractured structure that we have. I have fought so hard against this discount for the RPO for three years. Right? So that comes in where the political will comes in. Second part of it is, when the tariff increases, nobody puts in a question, nobody applies to the petition. My third question, like Mr. Bhushan said, two-thirds of the power is thermal. And a, a thought process like carbon sinks, etc., were never introduced into this country. It's a very late scenario. And last and ball is that if you are the CM of a Himalayan state, right, and you are the lung for Delhi, why shouldn't you get green bonds or water bonds, as for example in Norway, as for example in Sweden? Okay. To which this doesn't answer. And I think it's a ground reality that we have to face every day. That's why the pollution in Delhi, the AQ index, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not getting into all those technical because you're more urodite than me. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, uh, do you want to take the issue of consumption, Navroz, a little bit? I think it, it's an important issue that was raised that we can talk about all technology, but if you don't address the issue of consumption. Yeah. And uh, something about government policy that the last, coach, last gentleman had you were in the government, I'm sure you will be able to answer some of his queries. So, no yeah. <laughs> no longer your responsibility. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we will still ask you questions, Mr. Yeah. Rashmi. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think the, uh, the point, the shining the spotlight on consumption, I think, is, is, is quite important. I just want to make a link to the report that we're discussing today. Uh, there are various scenarios. Uh, played out in that report of how we might achieve 1.5. And the most um, uh, optimistic by far is the scenario where we actually have uh, high energy efficiency and low energy demand without sacrificing lifestyles too much. In other words, uh, a lot of the discussions around energy and energy transitions focus on the supply side. This scenario says, and there's a growing academic literature about it, that we should be thinking much harder about the demand side. Uh, and that we can be much more creative beyond appliances and, and, and ratings and so on, which are important, but also the way in which we design our cities, the way in which we design our buildings. Uh, so all the sort of passive things that we lock ourselves into, whether we're building road networks or rail networks for freight. These things can have huge implications on greenhouse gases. So there is a, the, the most cost-effective low carbon path is actually an ultra energy efficient path. Uh, and consumption is part of that, not just in terms of uh, uh, what we consume, but, but shifting the emphasis from the things we consume to the services we consume. So what you care about uh, increasingly should be less having a car, but how you get from point A to point B, right? If you can get from point A to point B in a way that is uh, uh, comfortable, easy, uh, and, and convenient, it need not have the form of sitting in a car. So that shift in mindset, I think, is very important. Um, so, so I sort of uh, 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 agree with your emphasis on, on that way of thinking about this, this challenge. Maybe 10 seconds on strengthening the Paris uh, uh, Agreement. Uh, so you said that um, you know, this report, I think that the politics of this report is very important. There's a group of countries, obviously, that wanted this report, that wanted to take this report and use it to make an argument for, in fact, strengthening uh, the Paris Agreement, or at least to come back to countries and ask them to up their pledges uh, within the framework of the Paris Agreement. And I think it, you know, my comments notwithstanding about how targets are not proportioned to what actually happens, everything else being equal, sure, better targets would have been okay, but I think that it could actually have aroused political pushback to ask countries to up their targets prematurely before they'd gone through one cycle of learning by doing. Because once you go through that one cycle, you find out if in fact it's cost effective to, to up your targets. That was a Paris context conversation. In a post-Trump context conversation, I don't think we are in any position to talk about strengthening the Paris Agreement. It's really just about defending what we have. 
uh, for the reasons you mentioned, including the political changes in, uh, in Brazil. You want me to focus on the government policy? Or government policy, or maybe uh, you said that you would like to respond to what should be the position of India ah. later. Okay. So maybe you can bring that element now. And then, because it is now becoming, frankly, both of you and versus me, frankly <laughs> speaking, okay? <laughs> so I am going to come in with some comment on your comments, okay? So that we can have a little more discussion. So what you said in Paris agreed with us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, now, India. What should India do? Yeah. Well, India. Well, the 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 it's um, the NDC, which government of India has offered. In fact, um, is is my own assessment is fairly good, uh, and and in, in fact, we are going to release a report on uh, G20 climate performance, the G G20 group of countries. Uh, depending on the climate uh, policies which they have followed. Uh, 14th, uh, a global report is coming out and on 21st, we will have a national release here. In fact, it lists India as one of the best countries as far as the ambition is concerned. In terms of ambition, the, the NDC offered by India is closest to the 1.5 degree scenario. No other country has done that. So I would not... Uh, uh, rate India poorly as far as the quality and the ambition uh, of the NDC is concerned. But yes, there is uh, ground for further action. Uh, it is not so much about the target, redefining the target or numerical uh, uh, targets, but about the quality of the action. There is, a, uh, uh, unless the, uh, as Navroz was talking about the lifestyles, it's a question of behavioral change. You cannot alter the energy demand uh, pattern unless you become conscious about environment. And it's a slow process. It's a long process. And it, it, but it, one has to start working towards that. The changing the energy supply systems, energy production systems, is not easy, but it is relatively easier. Because if that, is, that depends on the level of the investment and the kind of application of technology which you can. But behavioral change is difficult, it is gradual, and it will take a lot of time. And therefore, our, the, the, the next step that Government of India should take is about the, the, the quality of the low carbon uh, uh, growth which we should have. And there are ways of doing that. Certainly, I'm sure we can have a further discussion on that. Actually, we have Lavanya. Uh, you'd like to make comment? On the 1.5 Okay, sure target uh, actually to support you so that sure, you thank you so isolated yeah <laughs> well compelling as I always find my colleague Navroz um, and his intervention is always very persuasive uh, I think the 1.5 degree uh, target also has other functions it may not be directly proportional to the speed of response and I'm, I'm, you know I'm entirely convinced of that argument but it has a tremendous political and narrative building function it also have has an empowering and a knowledge creation function the 1.5 degrees as Mr. Rashmi said the target's been sort of uh, proposed by the small island states, by vulnerable countries for several years. It finally made it into the Paris Agreement. So it is an Article 2. It's an aspirational 1.5 degree target. And the target is not actually 2 degrees. It's well below 2 degrees, aspiring towards 1.5. Um, and it does send a powerful message. And it's a message that came with a request to, uh, to, to the IPCC Please to see. produce this report. So in the context of producing this report, for those few years, there was tremendous activity, research activity, knowledge creation, knowledge generation around uh, the impacts. And that's the um, other, I think, important thing about the 1.5 degree target and the report, is that in addition to this empowering and knowledge creation function, it also has, um, it also has this uh, function of actually uh, helping countries uh, realize, helping countries realize the impacts rather than focusing primarily on mitigation and on emissions and emitters because this, this is something that the vulnerable countries had put forward and allowing this to find pride of place in the Paris Agreement allowed these countries to put their positions and the impacts that they face at the forefront. And so it has a very powerful narrative building function as well. So it's not about whether we actually even attain 1.5 degrees 
um, in, in, you know, in the sort of speed that we need to do it or we uh, sort of make the changes that we need to make to attain that. I think it's about this larger context in which this conversation is happening. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just want to respond. Uh, Navroz reminded me of something which I did three years back, and I forgot about it, but let me just say. At Paris, few of us came together and did a press release essentially saying that 1.5 degree is in the rear view mirror. That, and thank you for reminding me. I would have kept that position, frankly speaking, if I would have not read 1.5C report. Okay. And as Gandhi said, let me quote Gandhi, you are stupid if you don't change your position in front of strong evidence. So today, let me say I'm changing my position, which I had taken three, three years back, that putting 1.5C in Paris Agreement is stupid. I think I was stupid. Okay. I had not understood at that point of time what is going to be the impact on poor, vulnerable? You know, I, I come from an organization which does a lot of work on the ground. Uh, people were there in Kerala when these floods happened. And it was devastating. Uh, and it was devastating to the most vulnerable community. Uh, farmers, horticulture farmer with half an acre of land. Okay. It wasn't big deal for rich people. So let me say that I, I, I now believe after reading that report, uh, and Mr. Rashmi, I just want to differ with you on one, one point. Actually, uh, 1.5C report is essentially, it also makes a very strong argument that beyond 1.5, adaptation is going to become very difficult. Okay? It is saying that if you, are, if you are going to go to two degrees, uh, maybe adaptation in most sector will not work. We will have to start talking about loss and damage. Okay, so beyond 1.5 degree adaptation will not matter in many sectors. I'm sorry? It's an ambition. We need to keep Please, uh, can, don't intervene in between. Please, thank you. Now, uh, let me, uh, I just want to make two points and look for response. The, the first point is, is national political economic system, does it represent the interest of the poor? Navroz, your argument would be very strong if there is a strong evidence to show that national political economic system overwhelmingly represents the interest of the poor and not of the rich. Because at the end of the day, the impact is going to be on the poor, okay? The benefit of remaining business as usual is going to be with the rich. And that you see in the US very clearly uh, that, or for example, countries with large hydrocarbon reserve, will they have interest to take care of poor countries and poor communities? So if, if, if that interest would be overwhelming, I'll agree with you that the national political economic system will be sufficient to increase ambition over a period of time. Okay. But the fact is, leave climate change in many, many environmental issues in India. Forestry, water supply, river pollution, air pollution, the interest of the poor doesn't even figure in the list. Climate change is, is a very different issue. Rashmiji, uh, the, the comment that I have, and there's a story that I was told that just before the Can Cancun agreement, the erstwhile planning commission, there was a meeting to decide what should be India's goal. And the story is that a graph was drawn that how India's emission intensity has reduced over the last 10 years. Then a pencil was taken and a straight line was drawn. And it so happened that the story is that it said that if we just do linear extrapolation, India will have 20 to 25% lower energy intensity of its economy by 2020. Let's give it as a Cancun agreement. We did this experiment for Paris as well. And if you draw the same line, India will reach 40% by 2030. So I do not think there was a lot of assessment done to understand what India will do. And I'm not accusing India alone. I think every country gamed the system. Every country gamed the system. This is what the status of climate change is. So I am challenging your basic assumption that national political economic system 
will take care of the interest of the poor because poor is going to get impacted by climate change. And that India's commitment is very ambitious. I am challenging that from you. Okay, please. Should I go first? Um, okay, thank you. Um, it's, 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 I'm glad this has become a debate <coughs> rather than a, <coughs> um, a softball discussion. So uh, my direct uh, response to you, Chandrabhushan, is, is, is in a couple of different parts. Um, I'm not claiming that national political economies necessarily represent the poor. What I am claiming is, is two different things. One is not a normative desire that we should stick with the national level. It is an objective observation that we have no choice but to make these things work at the national level. Because I think we are fooling ourselves if we think that global agreement then will translate to countries doing something different from what they would have done given, national, given the bounds of national discussion. Your limits of what you will do are determined by national poli political debate and electoral and other politics. That's an objective reality, I would argue. The international conversation can nudge it this way and that way. The narratives are indeed very important. But the center of gravity is this national context, not as a desirable, but as a something that we have to live with. Um, so so that's, that's my first response. The second response is that um, even if we don't, th that, that national political economies are not fixed, they're malleable. Which is why the work that we have to do is to make sure that they do a better job of representing the interests of the poor, which is I think many people in this room spend a great deal of their professional lives thinking about how best to do that and, and in small, whatever small ways we can, moving it in that, in that direction. So that is the, the, the target. So I would, I, would, I would, agreeing with the normative position that you're coming from, I would say that we should be thinking harder about how to move each national system along rather than trying to shift it by changing a number at the global level. The third observation tied to this is, do we really think, whatever the weaknesses of national political systems, that the global political economy better represents the interests of the poor? Surely not, right? If you had to decide where you were going to put your chips, uh, I would put it in, in efforts to nudge the national system along. Uh, I'll echo what Navroj is, uh, has said, that the interest of the global poor and also of the poor in India will be better served if we don't focus only on mitigation. We need to focus on adaptation equally. That is much greater and urgent uh, necessity of the poor. And we have, uh, in the global uh, discussions, we are completely marginalizing this discussion. So there is a need to if we talk about the poor, we need to redefine the strategy of addressing climate change. Uh, second uh, question about adequacy of India's goals or targets. Uh, if you compare with Cancun uh, or, uh, um, target, or in fact we used to call it at that time domestic goal, we didn't say it was a target because target was something which was considered an evil word because it had come down from Kyoto Protocol, which was a top-down, globally mandated target. It is a nationally determined target. That is the fundamental difference which you must understand, that a target which is nationally determined has to take into account the national imperatives, the national developmental imperatives, which are sustainable developmental imperatives. It is not a, a fraction of the global goal. It contributes to the global goal. So we must be very, very conscious of this uh, process of determination of the goal. So I would still uh, assert that this goal is reasonably ambitious. And there is a fundamental difference. You cannot compare the Cancun goal with Paris goal, as far as India's NDC is concerned, because the Cancun goal only talked about emissions intensity, which followed the Copenhagen Accord. In the Paris, the NDCs which have been given under the Paris Agreement, there are three distinct segments. It is not just about economy-wide emission intensity target. It is also about energy transition. And it is also about carbon sink, to which this gentleman had referred. So there are three distinct elements there. And these represent a fundamental change in the position of the government. 
uh, also of the the way we want to, the society to develop. Uh, <coughs> so energy transition is extremely difficult because it requires not only technologies, it requires a huge scaling up of the resources. We need to invest in renewable energy. There are huge problems in renewable energy. The gentleman was referring to renewable purchase obligations. Why, despite a carbon market functioning in the renewable energy, it is still not picking up because the discounts are in deep trouble. There are, there, is a, the, there are standard assets in the coal sector. So there are huge problems. Energy transition is not as easy as, easy as it sounds. It requires a lot of effort, political will, and investment. Secondly, about carbon sink. Carbon sink, again, is a kind, is, is, it depends on the number of changes, because it's a very long process. It's a, a long-term uh, process of change. Yes, a carbon sequestration cannot ha happen overnight, not even in 10 years. It takes 20, 30, 40 years for the carbon really to be sequestered and, b and be with us. If we burn down the forests, it's very easy. Uh, that's a different matter altogether. So carbon sinks, energy transition, and overall economy-wide emission ta in intensity targets they are all a part of this strategy. And I think the strategy is reasonably good. We need to scale it up by transforming its quality. Okay. Uh, we will have another round of question. One, and very short question. One, two. I would like a lady to ask a question. Please, let's have some gender balance here. <laughs> please. Yeah. One, two, and three. Yeah, please. Should I, should I start? Or? No, you start, please. Thank you. Uh, I think this uh, question has been partially addressed uh, by, uh, by several uh, questions and speakers, but not really um, the, the crux of the problem. The question of the U.S., starting with the, not only the U.S., but starting with the U.S., and we see this kind of contagion spreading all over the world, where we see a reflexive rejection of the liberal consensus, whether it is uh, you know, uh, faith in science, whether it is... Uh, intolerance, whether it is a rejection of human rights. We see this spreading across, whether it's Brazil, Turkey, you know, everywhere, in, including in India. So as uh, Navro said that the center of gravity is at the national level, and we see this contagion spreading at the national level, so how do we uh, reconcile this? Are, are we kind of, it, is it inevitable that, uh, you know, this is like, um, uh, it, it has its own momentum where uh, this, even though this uh, process of you, in, in, for all its difficulties, this you know, uh, difficult UN process, it is still, if we think of a liberal consensus, we are still moving in the, maybe, maybe slowly, but we are still moving in the right direction. We, you know, kicking and screaming, but we are moving in the right direction. But once you have this re reflexive re reject rejection of liberal consensus, then the whole thing goes out of the window. So how do we reconcile that? Madam? As I've uh, understood from both the uh, speakers, that the climate change, uh, this Paris Agreement, is not to be tickled anymore, any further. Then uh, what about the climate change related migration, which is happening in the Pacific Island nations, which has become a reality? How does the Paris Agreement uh, address to this issue? Okay. <coughs> My point is simple, like we have, is there anything I, I don't think I've read whatever I've read is there is any measurement of print at the local level, so district level, village, panchayat or ward level, and even at the individual level. So this is one point, this is one way that we should think of. That is one. Measurement of footprints at the local level, so individual, village or public ward, or panchayat or public ward, district and state level. Accordingly, we can decide many other things if we can do that. Second point is that we spoke about consumption life, lifestyles and all. There were communities and there were groups and reasons whose lifestyles were quite good and eco-friendly, nature-friendly. So are we taking examples from there and uh, or maybe having some incentives or disincentives for that? So these points have not been well taken care of, I think, also. Good evening, sir. Yeah. Sir, I just have two comments. First is that, sir, I think uh, it's the political leaders. Yeah. Good evening, sir. So I have two comments here. Uh, first is that, sir, um, it's for the political leaders uh, and the government to take steps, both nationally and internationally,
first as we see on Diwali, you know, we have uh, firecrackers, it's uh, like living in a gas chamber. So uh, this should be banned globally by the United Nations or United Nations Environment Program because uh, we have so many events happening every day, Commonwealth and Olympics and so many. Number two, sir, it's about depleted uranium. We have all seen, sir, uh, it's, uh, it has uh, radiations uh, uh, from this nuclear waste and uh, wars in Kosovo, Iraq, Serbia, everywhere. So this depleted uranium must be banned uh, globally and the United Nations must do something about it. Thank you. Uh, I'll take the last one. Then, yeah, we are running. Yeah, please. I, uh, just a small comment followed by a question. First of all, I've been noticing that a lot of people have been speaking about sustainable development. My question is very simple. Do you think at a two-degree at a, at a two target, we would actually have sustainable development in the sense that once the island nations are submerged and once the 580GT uh, carbon budget is exhausted and the permafrost, uh, and the permafrost is lost, uh, do we think we'll have sustainable development because sustainable development, by definition, is also intergenerational equity? So when we cannot secure the same world that we're living in right now for the future generations, is there any point of discussing sustainable development, sir? Okay, so first clap for a question. <laughs> uh, so we, we actually had one comment, uh, uh, two important questions. Threat on liberal global order, which is now becoming the WD task. Uh, intergenerational and sustainable development at, at, at two degrees. And what do we do for migration, which is already happening and will increase at 1.5 and 2 and the last, sorry. Oh, sorry. And the last one was, are we doing enough to understand and integrate the sustainable practices of communities across the world? R we are only talking about the consumption and lifestyle of probably the most polluting people. Okay. There are more sustainable uh, lifestyle that is there. So, four very important questions and I'll leave it to you to, you, you both can respond to all four and yeah. First, this issue of migration. Uh, it's not as if this issue has been lost sight of. Uh, it is very much present in the Paris Agreement and the current negotiations on the rule book are also, they include this particular issue. Uh, but migration is one aspect of how we prepare our strategy about adaptation. If we are not successful in handling the adaptation issues, we will not be able to address the issue of migration as well. Migration is just a result of how climate change is affecting us. And uh, as we were discussing earlier, the, the current discourse does not have enough space for providing resources for adaptation. We need to scale up the political will and the ways in which we can generate resources for adaptation. That's the only way we can handle migration issue. It is social, political, and not just that migration can uh, happen because of several factors. But even if you, if we agree that it is attributable to climate change and sea level rise and other things, even then the fact remains that we need to build up a momentum about adaptation and that is the central challenge of the current climate change negotiations. The issue about equity, intergenerational equity, which should define the actions of the countries, it's it's all very nice to talk about intergenerational equity, but what about intragenerational equity? The equity which is present here and now, there is a, there is a large body of poor within the country. Uh, Chandra Bhushan was talking about the global poor. What about the large body of poor who are existing here and now? What are we doing about them? We need, when we define equity, equity has to be both horizontal, vertical, and it has to take into account the, the entire time scale. So therefore, when we talk about equity, we need to be conscious about the needs of the people who are vulnerable, affected, and the needs of adaptation, as well as mitigation, which will hit cater to the needs of those who are still unborn. Thank you. OK. Uh, <coughs> thank you. Uh, very thought-provoking pro questions. Uh, the first question about sort of the politics, the, the global politics, starting with the, with the US. Um, you know, it's, it's very disheartening because I think most of us working in this area for a while have been hoping to see uh, um, uh, sort of a, glowing pub a growing public acceptance of this issue around the world as something that's important for us to, to engage with. And in fact, we find that important jurisdictions like the U.S. are moving in the opposite direction. Um, all I can 
says that the, uh, uh, and it gets back to Lavinia's point about the narrative. I mean, I think that in a, in a way, the um, perhaps a mistake that many of us who've been involved with this for a while have made was conflating climate change as a global issue. If, if you bring it down to, to ground realities, it is actually the aggregation of a lot of local issues. And that is much more likely to win political acceptance both in the US as well as in India. Uh, and I think Chand Bhushan gave that sort of poignant example of Kerala and other places. Um, you know, the US has had an unprecedented series of natural disasters and weather events and so on. And there are people I know actively working to try and make that case. But climate change has been tagged so much as this kind of hostile takeover by the UN that it's an, it's an uphill battle in that, in that country. But I don't think there's any choice but to actually reframe the conversation uh, uh, and make this about a series of locally felt uh, uh, issues. Um, I just want to come to the point about international generational equity and, and, and uh, sustainable development and so on. I also want to comment on this mitigation adaptation issue and the relative, I don't know why this is, uh, my phone put it far away, but. Um, uh, you know, the last IPCC report, the IPCC R5, I thought put this issue quite well. They said, we have no, maybe I'll just hand this to you. Uh, so yeah, please. Um, I'll just slide it away. Um, the, the, uh, they put it there quite well. They said, look, um, we have to mitigate because we can't adapt to a five or seven degree world. And we have to adapt because you're unlikely to mitigate sufficiently to, re to restrict it to less than a degree. Right? So you have to do both these things. But, uh, uh, so th but there is a, a, a trade-off in terms of political attention. Right? Mitigation arguably requires more global coordination and adaptation, so there's co a collective action problem with mitigation. With adaptation, every country gets 100% of any investment in adaptation. They only get that ratio of their emissions to global emissions gain from any investment in global mitigation. Right? So there's a larger collective action problem. So perhaps it's understandable why we talk about it much more. But within systems, we have to definitely, I agree with Mr. Rashmi, focus on adaptation. And I just want to make one final comment in response to, 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 to you, Chandrabhushan. I mean, I think you made the point that you know, um, you've rethought your position after this report. And I, and I actually think I have uh, as well. Because it is startling to see how much difference the 1.5 and 2 can make. And I've sort of interrogated my own thought process, thinking, you know, does that mean that this learning by doing dynamic is insufficient? And I've come to the conclusion that we don't have any option but to do the learning by doing dynamic, but what we can change is the language where we say, all right, we're going to think about sustainable development, we're going to think about co-benefits, et cetera, et cetera. I think the time has come to, even in countries like India, where we don't have historical responsibility for the problem, we have to more explicitly talk about the impacts of climate change and how much more difficult that will make our own development challenges and bring climate change more centrally into the conversation and its own direct impacts using uh, uh, the evidence of, of reports uh, such as this. So I think, you know, there's a, I think we, we sort of share a sense of alarm uh, uh, from this report. Okay. We are running out of time. Uh, let me make uh, two comments before we end this uh, discussion. Uh, thank you very much for participation. I thought the questions were superb. <coughs> 1.5C report says that the cost of remaining within 1.5C is about 2.5% of global GDP. 2.5% of global GDP. The investment in arms in the world is about 2.3% of GDP. So we spend equal amount of money killing, the same money can be used for saving lives. So as far as money is concerned, I think it is not too much. It is about misplaced priority. If we understand the implication and internalize that implication, I mean to say, you know, more people die because of pesticide poisoning in India then they die because of terrorism. But we spend 1,000 times more money on protecting ourselves from terrorists than in terms of protecting our farmers from pesticide. Okay. So I think we also have to turn the question on its head. What is going to be our priority in this world? Having more arms or saving more lives? OK, 
Okay, I think it is an ethical question to be asked by every one of us. Okay. Maybe then we will find answer. The second issue is, and I, I will go back to your question, I do not think we will have sustainable development at two degree, even in intragenerational. Intergenerational is a different issue. Because at two degree, we will have more poor people. In fact, one flood in Kerala will get more people into acute poverty. They will go back into poverty. One loss of one season crop is more than enough for 30% of India to go back into poverty again. So at two degrees, we will, we will not even have intergenerational equity and sustainable development. Intergenerational is, you are young, therefore you are asking this question, but I think uh, it's, it's even that far off. Intergenerational equity we will not have. I have taken the opportunity as the, as the moderator to say the last word. Thank you very much for coming. And uh, let's give a big hand to both the panelists. Thank you. <laughs>